Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another podcast of Wrestling with God. And this podcast is being recorded just a week or so before Christmas. And I think this brings up some really important questions. Does the birth of Christ matter? Does the Christmas narrative matter? Does it have any relevance for us today in the modern world? And to help me wrestle with those questions is the producer of Wrestling With God podcast series, Katie Melia. And Katie has fielded some questions from our listeners and she'll be asking me the questions and we will have that back and forth. Katie, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, so you're all ready? I'm ready. What, can you say a little bit, just a little bit about yourself? like? how many kids you have, and just let our listeners get to know you a little bit. I'm the mother of three little boys, ages 13, 10, and 7, and I work at the Assisi Institute, and I guess that's, that's Can it. Can I add one more piece? Sure. You are, you are very brave in two ways to work at the Assisi Institute. Katie <laughs> does a wonderful job with all of our technology and media-related outreach and secondly, she's very brave because she is homeschooling three children all at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Katie. So go ahead, Katie, start with the questions. Okay. Is the Jesus story a myth? Is the birth of Jesus a historical fact? Is Jesus actually a historical person? That's a good question. And it's interesting, I had a conversation just the other day with a friend of mine who is uh, a well-known history professor at a well-known university. And I kind of knew the answer before I asked him, but I asked him this question, knowing that it was probably gonna come up at some point. And what he said is universally, almost universally, all historical scholars, not religious scholars, but secular scholars, believe that Jesus was a historical person. He did exist, that he was some kind of spiritual teacher. Now, these aren't faith statements. These are what historians are saying, that he was some kind of um, spiritual teacher, a rabbi of his day and age, and that there's some core truth to the passion narrative. It's most likely that he really was crucified. Uh, so again, what most, the vast, vast majority of secular historians will say that Jesus was indeed a historical person. Now that's a little bit different than questions of faith, but just from a historically uh, scientific perspective, yes, Jesus is or was an historical person and did exist. And let me just say why this is important. Because in the Jewish Christian tradition, and we could also say this in terms of Buddhism, and we could say this in terms of Hinduism, that spiritual teachings are not just some sort of ideological perspective on life. They're rooted in history. They're rooted in the human experience. They're not just something ethereal in the heavens. They may come from above but if we can't connect our spiritual beliefs and our spiritual traditions with our everyday historical existence, then I don't know that they have a whole lot of value. So this question of whether or not Jesus was an historical person really does have some uh, existential relevance. How's that? Good, that's interesting. Okay. You got some other questions there? I do. The next question is, does it matter if Jesus's mother was a virgin? And does the Christmas narrative even matter in this day and age? Why should we celebrate it? All right, so there's actually three questions there, but I think they're ultimately all related. Let me start with the virgin birth. And at some point I'm gonna do a podcast on the resurrection of Jesus and the virgin birth. So I'm not gonna to go too deeply, but I'm gonna to touch on them. But let me just start from, from this perspective that, well, I'll pick up from where I left off with the first question. 
is that Christianity purports to be an historical religion, a historical spiritual path. And again, what, what do I mean by that? It's not just some kind of ethereal wisdom that Jesus taught and passed on to us, that the whole essence of the Jewish Christian lineage is that God does intervene in the history of humankind. It's not like, you know, wisdom just drops from the heaven and we apply it and it makes our life a little bit easier as we cope with our circumstances. That, there's a piece of that that's true. But at a deeper level, Christians and Jews alike, and I would, again, extend that to Hindus, that God interacts with our history. God intervenes in our history. So I, I think that's an important point. So let me connect that to Mary's virginity. In the, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures, there's different levels to the meaning of virginity, but at, at a real simple level, a virgin is one who belongs totally to God. A virgin is one who whose will, if we can say it that way, is totally surrendered to the divine will. Now, that, in that understanding, a virgin doesn't necessarily have to be celibate. A virgin is one whose, again, will is totally and completely united with God's will. So certainly in that generic sense, Jesus was born of a virgin because we believe, Christians believe that uh, she was one with the divine will. But let me, again, wrestle with the question, what about literally her virginity? And again, I put that in the same context uh, as the resurrection of Jesus. And people will say, well, does it really matter that Jesus was resurrected or not physically? And I think it does matter because, again, what a healthy spirituality purports to do is to bring the divine into uh, our everyday human lives and to elevate our human life in a sense into the divine life. But it's always a marriage of the two and not some kind of Gnostic separation or division or dualistic separation. So I think, for example, that the resurrection of Jesus matters because it tells us if it's true, and I do believe it's true, what it tells us is that the love of God is really the most powerful force in all of creation, even more powerful than death itself, and that we have access to that love. We have access to that spiritual energy, and we can learn to incorporate it into our individual lives and our collective lives to improve the life of humanity in general and our own individual lives. So spirituality in this context is not just about, again, escaping to some esoteric spiritual world. And it's not about just waiting to death for death so that we can go to heaven. It's about bridging heaven and earth. And I do believe that Jesus' bones are not rotting in some grave in the Middle East, that there was a transformation that took place and his human body was divinized. So if that can happen for Jesus, it can happen for us at some level, levels of gradation. So for example, in the Kriya Yoga tradition, I teach Kriya Yoga in the tradition of Paramahansa Yogananda, there is this belief in Babaji who they say is a deathless guru. And Yogananda, who died in 1952, met him in person. His guru, Sri Yukteswar, met him. So you have these eyewitnesses of somebody meeting Babaji, this deathless guru. And it's, it's, very, it's a parallel to the resurrection. And again, the point is, if that was true for Babaji, at some level, that can be true for us. That over time, we can transform human life into the divine life, not in the sense that we reject the material world, but we divinize it. So let me talk about the virgin birth in the same context. 
Well, I, I want to go to a little bit of science. It's a little bit of a stretch here. But what was there before there was creation? What was there before there was the Big Bang? There was not a material universe. The material universe emerged out of, out of spaciousness, out of a void. Okay, well, where did that material universe, where did the Big Bang come from? Did nothing create everything? Or did something miraculous happen so that out of that void, out of that nothingness, material creation came into existence. It's a kind of virginal birth at some level. There wasn't, there wasn't one physical thing that caused another physical thing because we know it, there was a time when there was no physical universe. And we know that the way we experience the material universe now, one thing causes another thing, right? Well, if there was nothing, then there was no cause in any physical sense something miraculous had to happen. And if you go 3.5 billion years ago, that's when scientists say about that time that life occurred on planet earth. Well, it's another kind of leap. We went from inorganic matter, non-living matter to life and life that is self-reproducing. Now scientists can't, they can't do that in the laboratory. They can't create life in the laboratory. Something happened in that leap from lifelessness to life and then to conscious life. Where did that come from? Where did that leap come from? It's kind of another virginal birth in a sense. So is it, a, that, is it an entire stretch to say that... Um, that the virgin birth happened? No, because at some level we've seen it happen in the course of history, the history of the material universe. And one last thought about that, and I'm gonna paraphrase the psychologist that I like a lot, Jordan Peterson. We don't know the limits of what's possible when we are absolutely one with the divine. I'm going to repeat that. And again, I'm paraphrasing Jordan Peterson. We don't know the limits of what is possible when we are absolutely united to the divine. We haven't explored or exhausted the limits of absolute union with God. So from that perspective, we can't say that it's entirely impossible because we don't know the limits of when the human will and the human imagination is one with, absolutely one with the divine will and the divine imagination. Again, looking back in, into the history of our material universe, there were these significant leaps out of nowhere that occurred. So we don't know the limits of what's possible again when we're one with the divine. How's that, Katie? That's really, that's good. I learned a lot in that, so. Okay. Good. Very interesting. I, know I, I gave you a long answer. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Okay. My next question is, was Jesus really the son of God or a divine incarnation? And what does that even mean? Wow. That's a, you guys are giving me, whoever's writing these questions, you're giving me easy questions. Um, let me put it in this context. And I think I'm going to go to the prologue of John's gospel because it's related to the birth of Jesus. And in the prologue of John's gospel, what we're told is that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And it goes on to say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's also a second reading from the Greek, uh, just as uh, it's just as accurate as an interpretation or translation. And so in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and then the word pitched his tent among us. And, and the word, the Greek word for, the, for word is actually logos. So let me give you some examples of what's meant by logos. Logos was a Greek philosophical term. 
and it's referring to the mind of God within creation that is organizing everything. So a more accurate translation of the prologue is that in the beginning was the Logos, the Logos with, was with God and the Logos was God. So another way of understanding the Logos is that it is the logic of God, but it's not just some intellectual heady logic. It's not, it's the intelligence of God, but not in a heady intellectual way. It is the intelligence of God, the logic of God that is shaping and forming and organizing creation. So what Christians believe, and I hold to, is that Jesus was so transparent to that logos, so open to that logos, so transparent that he fully embodied the divine logos. He was fully one with the logos, with the mind of God, that he incarnated it within himself. <clears throat> Hinduism has a, has a similar belief that, and I'm paraphrasing a quote from the Bhagavad Gita, which is probably the most sacred scripture for the Hindus, and I'm paraphrasing, when um, when virtue declines and vice predominates, when the world is going crazy, that God incarnates as an avatar to bring about righteousness and to do away with evil um, activities. So what that means is that, and I'm bring this back to Jesus, that Jesus's birth wasn't from compulsion. It wasn't from karma that that Jesus the Christ chose to be born to overcome the evil that is in the world. So he's the son of God, yes, in the sense that he fully embodies this logos, almost like you could say he was a, a, a appeal box for the mind of God, for the intelligence of God, for this organizing uh, intelligence. So I've Two other comments on that. What does it have to do with, with you and me and our day-to-day -day lives? And how do we know there is this thing called the Logos? Well, I'll give you some examples that the Logos is permeating all of creation. The intelligence is organizing. Intelligence of God is permeating every aspect of creation. So for example, Every three seconds, approximately 50,000 cells die in our body. And 50,000 cells are reproduced, knowing exactly what their role is as that particular cell. Now you can say, well, that's DNA, but what is DNA? It's information. And what does that information reflect? It reflects the organizing intelligence of God. So this, this logos is not just a theory, it's, it's in everything. Every atom in, of, of gold has the same number of electrons and protons, I believe. Every, every atom of silver has the same number of protons and electrons. And it's a different number of protons and electrons than, than are in gold. Everything is organized a particular way. And that organization is the divine mind in time and space, in creation, organizing it. And that's what Jesus fully embodied. That's what we mean when we say he is the son of God, that he was completely transparent to the divine mind and to the divine will and to the divine love. Now, this is what most people don't realize, that as human beings, like Jesus, we have the capacity to open our minds and our hearts so that we can learn to consciously be in the flow of this divine logos, this divine wisdom, that we can step by step, slowly but surely, we too can learn to live a divine life. And I, I would take this further, it's not only can we, at this point in the history of the human race, we have to. If we're gonna overcome the challenges that are facing us, enough of us have to be open to this divine wisdom, to the consciousness of God, however you want to say it, 
so that we can learn to navigate through with divine wisdom and with divine love and divine intelligence so that we can learn to navigate through the steep challenges that we are facing. This is why spiritual practice is so important, like meditation and contemplative prayer, so that in those moments of stillness and silence and communion with the divine, that divine intelligence begins to percolate into our awareness and we begin to be conscious of it and we begin to consciously cooperate with it. That's why, you know, one of the questions that was asked earlier is, does the birth of Jesus have any meaning for us? It, it absolutely does. And not just as a past event to be celebrated, but as an experience to be entered into. It's not just a proposition to believe or not believe. It's, it's the Christmas experience is a life to be lived. That's a great explanation. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? I have two more. Um, the first one is, we hear the term Christ consciousness. What is it and what does it have to do with what we're talking about? It's a good question. It's very much related to what I was just talking about. And Christ consciousness is a term that uh, Yogananda made popular. Again, Yogananda was a great saint from India who came to the United States in 1920 and died in 1952. And Christ consciousness is really another term for this logos, for this mind of God that is penetrating everything. And what Yogananda stressed, uh, very, very uh, stressed in a very significant way, is that if we, again, we pray, we meditate, we open our hearts, that we can access this Christ consciousness and it can become more and more a part of our daily lives. So just as we say, Jesus Christ, we can say, the goal is for you to be Katie Christ. <laughs> and that doesn't mean you have to move to the Middle East and speak Aramaic like Jesus did or become Jewish. It just means that you have the capacity and the potential to integrate that Christ consciousness, that logos, that mind of God into your own life. Uh, Mother Teresa said, don't just imitate Christ, become Christ by merging with this divine mind, by surrendering our will to God's will um, by living from uh, this logos and letting it become a living reality in their life. That's Christ consciousness. Interesting. And I have one more question. Okay. Do, does a person have to be a Christian to enter into the spirit of Christmas? No, but let, let me answer that on, on two levels. First one may seem like an indirect answer, but when I'm done with the two answers, you'll see how they, 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 they connect and they interrelate. First of all, I wanna just talk a little bit about the importance of narratives and particularly spiritual narratives and sacred narratives. There are actually psychological studies that show that when people have a, a positive narrative by which they live their lives, a positive story, that it actually has a very positive effect on the nervous system. That when people are live their lives according to a, an uplifting narrative, that their brain produces more endorphins uh, and all the good feeling chemicals. So just on a sort of scientific, physiological level, neurological level, having a good story, a good narrative that guides our life is really important. Atheism is the narrative that guides our life. So everybody has a story. Uh, they may say, well, no, my story is rooted in science. And I'm an absolute believer in science, but there's a difference between science and scientism. And many people uh, treat science as a religion and make it their story. So we all have a narrative. And my point is the narratives that guide our lives are very important. And I'm just saying that the Christmas narrative is a really powerful narrative, if you understand it. And I don't, I don't have enough time and space in this context to go through all the nuances of the Christmas narrative. But probably what sums it up is that Jesus is referred to as Emmanuel, which means God with us. What the Christmas story is telling us is, number one, that God is with us. 
not just when things are going well, God is with us in all, in all circumstances and at all times. The divine mind, the divine logos that we've been talking about is embedded in human history and is working through human history to take us where we need to go. That's just one aspect of the Christmas narrative. So I think the Christmas narrative is an important narrative. It really paints a picture of reality that I think reflects ultimate reality. Now the question, do you have to be Christian to appreciate it and to celebrate it? This may surprise some people, but, but no. I'd like to remind people that first and foremost, Jesus was a Jewish mystic. He didn't necessarily come to found a new religion. That's not a critique of Christianity. I consider myself a Christian. But he did not come to create a new religion. He came to renew Judaism and then to open the whole world to all the graces that are present in the Jewish Christian tradition. He came to open humanity's minds and hearts to the logos and to the love of God. So one does not have to become in any institutional way, a Christian to enter into the Christmas spirit. I'll give you a good example of this. I have a friend who used to work as a hospital chaplain, and he's a Protestant minister. And a Hindu, a fa uh, there was a Hindu family whose child was ill, and they asked him to pray with the family for on behalf of the child. And he started out with a Christian prayer, praying to Jesus. Then halfway through, he caught himself. He said, I apologize. I know that you're Hindu. And their response to him was very interesting. They said, that's okay. We, we love Jesus too. You can pray to Jesus. We believe in Jesus too. So the, the point is, you don't have to be a Christian in any formal sense to really appreciate Jesus and to really enter into some kind of conscious relationship with him. Again, I'll use Paramahansa Yogananda as an example. He was a Hindu, uh, but he talked about having visions of Jesus, Jesus appearing to him, and he never ceased to be a Hindu, and he didn't become a Christian in the formal sense, but he certainly integrated who Jesus was and the teachings of Jesus into his life. So I'll, I'll close this question this way. Jesus belongs to the whole world, just like Krishna belongs to the whole world, just like Buddha belongs to the whole world, just like Ananda Moyama, the great uh, Hindu saint. She lived and she died in the 1970s. She belongs to the whole world. So Jesus belongs to the whole world and the Christmas narrative belongs to the whole world. That's How's crazy. that? I love it. Thank you. Any Very, other questions you have there? No, that's it. All right. Well, Katie, I want to thank you for uh, giving me these questions. Uh, I want to thank the people who gave the questions. And I want to encourage my listeners to more and more send their questions in. I really want to wrestle with them. Yes. And uh, I really appreciate that. And Katie, I want to wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. And I want to Thank wish you. everybody tuning in a Merry Christmas. May God bless everybody. Namaste. Merry Christmas to everybody all over the world. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Amen. Goodbye, everybody.